But for now, let us read our acceptance of gifts together, which is on the yellow pew card. We offer these gifts with gratitude, and we acknowledge the constant gifts of time, talent, and treasure that strengthen and nourish this congregation as a reflection of our commitment to community within and without, our purposeful spirituality that is ever searching and growing, and our intentional actions that lead to greater justice in our congregation, our city, our nation, and our world. I set for myself a tall order for this morning because what I wanted to do was I wanted to introduce a number of different Afrofuturist voices in smaller readings that help cast a hopeful vision for the future. I did not succeed. Most of the, there are so many wonderful voices to, to consider, and also they don't write in nice 50 to 100 word micro fictions that don't need a context. So I'm gonna share one longer story with you today with some recommendations in your order of service on the back page there if you want to explore additional Afrofuturist writings or films to add to your own personal scriptures. There are some options there. That's not an all-inclusive list. It's just some to start with. But why are we focusing on the future? Juneteenth is about a historic event. Why focus on the future? Well, we still have a long way to go, for one thing. I read an article this week that said, well, so you know, in many countries, including the United States, people from non-white communities have been hit the hardest by COVID-19. And that's because people in non-white communities generally have less access to good health care. They are more likely to be essential workers that we rely on, and they're more likely to die from COVID than their white counterparts. And though many of us are aware of this, new research suggests that among white people, simply hearing about this disparity makes COVID seem less threatening, and it reduces support for public health measures. Isn't that unbelievable? So although we celebrate Juneteenth today, we are aware that the world is not as we would want it to be. That we are not as we would want to be. And black artists have commented on this disparity for generations. Some of them have done so with greater hope in mind. And I, w I think of Sun Ra with his film Space is the Place, where his solution is to take all the black people that are willing to go and go to Jupiter because that's a better place. Let's have our own planet. And to those young African Americans that he is inviting on this trip, they are somewhat skeptical and they ask, are you for real? And Sun Ra responds, I'm not real, just like you. You don't exist. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both myths. I do not come to you as a reality. I come to you as the myth, because that's what black people are, myths. I come from a dream that black man dreamed long ago. I am actually a present sent to you from your ancestors. Astro-black theology or mythology, Sun Ra believed, could inspire a reinvention of political reality. He said, I really prefer mythocracy to democracy before history. Anything before history is myth. That's where black people are. Reality equals death because everything which is real has a beginning and an end. Myth speaks of the impossible, of immortality. And since everything that's possible has been tried, we need to try the impossible. Sun Ra's words characterized a great deal of his music and philosophy. 
Some of what we dream for the world probably seems impossible. And yet the more we see and read and hear visions of hope for what the future can be, the more likely we are to believe that we can co-create it. So, I share a story with you today, a little longer, but one complete story, a short history of migration in five fragments of you. Your name is Asaki, and you can tell that you are being taken south because the wind is in your face and the clay-like redness of the soil is slowly becoming a yellow sandiness. The soil is all you see. Everything else is a blur. You scream for help in desperate, high-pitched shrieks, but it seems there is no one willing to save you. Desperation claws at your belly like an unanswered hunger. You remember that you had only stopped walking briefly, pausing as you navigated your way back from your mother's farm at the place where the emu and the buse pathways met. You'd paused to make the seemingly mundane choice of which route to take when a powerful arm suddenly wrapped itself around your torso, hoisted you onto a sturdy shoulder, and began to run. A moment was all it took. Screaming even louder, you consider that you did not really need to go to the farm today, or any other day for that matter. There was no need for the daughter of the great hunter Adiboyede, the niece of the Baale of Olubuse, to go to the farms. Your family has never lacked anything. Your father's lands begin along the banks of the river El Abusu and run all the way down to Ulubuse's limits, where great big trees stand like soldiers guarding your uncle's territory. But you went anyway, because you like to work with your hands. You enjoy the feel of soil beneath your feet, and you relish the sight of verdant life around you. You decided to go to the farm today, because the quiet beauty of the rising sun at dawn had spread over the sky, cloudless and taut like a drumskin, and called to you. You went seeking nature's touch. Now you are being carried along a snaking pathway, carved into the reeds that stand beside the river like a loyal spouse, a path that takes you far away from home. You writhe and wrestle and fight with all the might you can muster, but it is futile. The hands that have you are iron and do not loosen their grip. You remember the stories that sad visitors from nearby villages would sometimes tell of children who had been kidnapped and sold to strange men from faraway lands, and you wonder if this is happening to you. Just then the wind carries the unmistakable briny tang of the ocean air to your nose. You scream louder. Your name is Newton Brooks, and it is your turn to go into the hold and take stock of the human cargo. But you do not want to go into the belly of this wretched whale where men, women, and children are chained and crammed into every available space like beasts. The stench is appalling. Even the, the walkway is mired in filth. Starved of food, kindness, and humanity, many of them have little choice but to die. You tell the chief mate that you were never meant to be aboard this abomination, that you are no slaver. You're just a man seeking his fortune whose brother-in-law offered him free passage to the new world in exchange for your services as crewman on his ship. If you had known this was his vessel, you would have refused his kindness. The chief mate spits a gob of something brown and viscous and tells you to stop talking and start counting before he puts a knife in you. He looks angry, but the clearer emotion plastered across his thickly bearded face is impatience. You choose not to test him. You clamber down the hatch reluctantly, carrying a lantern and some rope, and begin to audit the ship's misery, counting corpses, and trying to ignore the sunken, accusing eyes of the living that stare back at you. You steal your heart, close your mind, and try to do your duty, aware that these eyes will haunt you for years to come. You reach a column, and you see a young girl lying still on the wooden floor, delicate and angelic, even as she is surrounded on all sides by her own filth. You tally her as dead, 
and turn away, but something gnaws at you, small but persistent and urging. You turn back and walk toward her, set your lamp on the floor and take her hand in yours to feel her pulse. Her eyes open slowly, revealing brown orbs set in a sea of jaundiced yellow. An emotion overwhelms you, something soft and warm and strange but fundamentally human that you're frightened of. You decide suddenly in that moment what you will do, knowing what it will cost and that it will change the course of your life forever. You are 12 years old and you are running through your grandfather's cornfield, laughing carefree and wild as the summer breeze. You are being chased by Tom Wiggins, your best friend and the overseer's son. He is desperate to turn the tide in the game of hide and seek that you are currently winning. You bank left hard and burst through the curtain of stalks and leaves onto a dirt road. You realize too late that you are going too fast to keep from colliding with the regal man talking with your father and Brutus Wiggins, the overseer. You crash into him clumsily and he falls to his knees. When you manage to get up and reorient yourself, your father is glaring at you, his caramel skin glimmering in the hazy shine of the afternoon sun. Amira Brooks, how many times have I got to tell you not to keep running around this here cornfield like you're being chased by the devil, child? Sorry, Papa. Tom's running real hard behind me, and I didn't want to ruin the cucumbers, but I was running too fast to stop, and I was going to run into them, so I turned. I'm sorry. The man rises slowly, dusting at his trousers with his calloused hands. He has a thick imperial mustache, and his skin is darker than yours, but he reminds you of your white grandfather, whose thick beard and strange mannerisms always make you smile. That's all right, he says with a smile of his own. I have two young boys about your age, and they run around and knock me down so often I'm used to it by now. You're the one I came to see anyway. He looks directly at you, and you decide you like him because he has honest brown eyes. Tom appears from behind the curtain of corn and is seized by Brutus, who takes him by the shoulder and starts to walk with him toward the shed. You hope Tom isn't in trouble because of you. The regal man with the mustache watches them briefly and then asks, Tell me, Amira, do you like school? Of course, I love it, you exclaim eagerly, because it's true. You love learning about things and ideas and numbers and how if you put them together in just the right way, you can describe the most amazing things. The man says, well, I can't say I'm surprised. Your teacher, Miss Emily, said you were the smartest girl she's ever come across. You blush. And looking more at your father than at the man, you say with puffed-up cheeks, Miss Emily is wonderful. She taught me some real fancy math called differential calculus, and it's just the most wonderful thing. I see. You watch the old man's eyes dance in their sockets, animated and alive with an idea or a thought or a vision that has seized him like a fit of epilepsy. He says something to your father in deliberately hushed tones. You, your father says something back. Then the old man bends over and extends his hand to you. My name is George, George Elijah Culver, from Michigan, up north. Pleased to meet you, Miss Amira. You take his hand. It is hard, but it is warm. And then he says, how would you like to come with me to Michigan? We have a special boarding school there for bright young colored kids, just like yourself, where you can learn about differential calculus and lots more things they won't ever teach you in regular school. Would you like that, Amira? You smile. You are sitting with Akin in his sprightly 62 Opel Commodore parked beside Iowa State University's Lake Laverne. The Temptations' My Girl is on the radio. It is two weeks to Valentine's Day, and the heater is on even though the car is not moving. Somewhere in some recess of your mind, you are wondering how much gas the vehicle is consuming just to keep you both warm. He is telling you something in his lilting Yoruba accent, and you are staring at his face intently, wondering in another little recess of your mind what your grandmother would have said if you told her you were dating someone from West Africa from Nigeria. The words are so 
something out of Akin furiously. Then unexpectedly, he slows down and measuring his words asks, Darla Culver Brooks, will you marry me? Your breath catches and all your diffuse thoughts condense like water vapor from a breath blown against a window in winter. His proposal is unexpected, but not surprising. You have both discussed the possibility for months now, and you have been in some way waiting for it, even though you did not know when it would come. You feel tension in your neck and dryness in your throat because you know that what you say next could close the door on choir practice with the lovely girls of First Baptist, on the weekly dinners with your parents, and even, perhaps, on the annual Thanksgiving dinner with your large, loving family. You gaze and you wonder just how much your life will change, having only been to Nigeria once and seen it not just for all its beauty and potential, but also its shortcomings. The unknown beckons, and you gaze into its eyes in that moment, wondering about the new friends and colleagues you will make, the heat and the food and the potential of the country you will call home, and if you will receive the same warmth and love as you have now, from the family that will adopt you as their own. And then you stop wondering about things and let yourself be overwhelmed by how happy Akeem's proposal makes you feel, how much you want to hold him, make love to him, bear children with him, grow old with him. You let yourself say, yes. You stare through the observation panel at the planet's moon. A pale alabaster orb with streaks of bright brown crisscrossing it like the etchings of a great cosmic artist. Up close, with nothing but the blackness of space framing it, the vision is beautiful, almost worth the year-long trip to this satellite that you hope will tell humanity something new about its place in the universe. For some reason you are not entirely sure of, the sight of Jupiter's moon sends a pang of familial hankering through you. In your pocket is an old picture of you with your family, brother Fimi, father Akin, and your mother Darla. In it, your father still has his afro. You and your brother are young children, and your mother's hair is dark and braided. She is holding you tight against her chest, and your brother is pulling at her skirt, smiling. You've been thinking a lot about your family. There was not much else to do on this voyage. Now you are about to land on Europa, and the constant thoughts about them have become a longing for them. You wonder if you made the right choice volunteering for this mission. Vitali, the Russian navigation officer who has become your friend and lover, is floating lazily beside you. Moyen, he calls to you. You turn, still thinking about your family, to see him pointing at an electric orange patch splashed against the mostly blue and green background of his display screen. His broad, heavy-set shoulders partly obscure what he's looking at. There are active cryovolcanoes in our primary landing zone, he begins. It will be too hot to land there for the next 72 hours or so. But, he smiles and points with stark, heavily veined hands to something on his screen, I already asked Agatha to check for alternate landing zones for the explorer, and she found two that are perfectly safe. We can either head for the Konamara Chaos, which Agatha assures me isn't as bad as it sounds, or we can descend onto the Rima Lintical, which was our original landing zone before Nairobi Mission Control redirected us anyway. Agatha, you call out into the small, empty space around you. Yes, Captain, the AI responds. Which of the landing zones is preferable given the current and projected conditions over a 72-hour cycle? Both have landing safety factors between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. I already checked, Captain, Vitali says, his face and graying hair illuminated by his display screen. Basically, once you factor in the uncertainty window, there's no significant advantage going either way in terms of safety, so it's really up to you. Where do you feel like going? You reach for your own display screen to check the explorer's metrics, and the picture you are carrying in your pocket slips out, drifting away from you and spinning, so that in one moment you see yourself and your family, in the next, white emptiness. You freeze and find yourself struck by a kind of clarity. You see yourself 
for what you are, an aggregation of the choices and decisions of all that have come before you, stretching back into infinity and beyond. All of these choices, uncertain and fearful and hopeful as the people who made them, all conspired with each other to bring you to this place, to this point, to now. Choices not unlike the one you are about to make. This clarity gives you a comfort you did not know you needed, but you are grateful for. You reach for the picture, take it, and smile. Right, you say. Let's head for the lenticle. I, Captain, Vitaly is smiling too. You suspect he already knew your decision before you made it. You both swipe away your personal display screens, float to the main control panel, and strap yourselves into your chairs. The translucent input surface before you beckons. You key in the landing initialization sequence and begin to descend rightward to Jupiter's sixth moon with the fortitude of an eternity of humanity behind you. A hopeful story. A story that does not begin with hope. It's a trajectory from forced relocation to making a choice to lead people into new territory. I don't think I need to say much about the story itself. I'm grateful to have discovered it. I read a lot of wonderful stories getting to this one, and I hope you have the same experience as you explore hopeful stories. The world around us does not always inspire hope, but may we receive stories of hope and be empowered and empower one another, especially the people of color in our circles, so that we might co-create a world of freedom and justice and peace. Amen and blessed be. Let's sing together Another hopeful song, Come and Go With Me. It is number 1018. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing together. If you are with us online today, I meant to mention that the, that story, A Short History of Migration in Five Fragments of You, is by an author named Woli Talabi, who writes a lot of great Afrofuturist short stories. There's an anthology of his that you may want to check out. 
And if you're with us online, please do like, share, and subscribe. That's how we extend our ministry out beyond our physical space. But in our physical space, next week, there is a potluck brunch at 11 o'clock. It's at an interesting time because we're going to be live streaming worship from General Assembly downstairs at 1230. That's when it's actually going to be happening in Portland, Oregon. So since that's a weird time to worship, we thought we may as well give you a reason to show up at 11 next week. So thank you to all of the many volunteers who have already stepped up. If you are interested in serving with that brunch, uh, we could still use a couple more hands. Many hands make light work. So 11 o'clock next Sunday, brunch downstairs in the fellowship hall, followed by worship live streamed from GA. And we have put together a special little reel that Mike provided and I kind of assembled to, uh, to have some music in, in between brunch and general assembly if you're a fast eater. So if you liked some of the videos that the choir made during pandemic streaming times, you'll get a second run at them uh, next week. Then after that, July 3rd, worship begins at 10.15. 10.15 a.m. worship, you've heard it here, you've probably seen it in other places, do not say we didn't warn you. 10.15 a.m. worship on July 3rd and throughout the summer and maybe on into infinity and beyond for that too. Our summer worship theme is connection and we've got some really great services lined up for that. This week, there's a summer solstice ceremony. The UUCC Women's Wisdom Group invites you to a celebration of summer solstice and a labyrinth walk on Tuesday at 7 p.m. on the West Lawn. Please bring a chair or something to sit on if you don't want to sit on the grass. And the labyrinth is going to stay up through July 3rd. Reverend Rena Scher is going to be facilitating a labyrinth walk after the July 3rd service, which is at? <laughs> yes, exactly. Today, if you are willing and able, Ray Gonzalez, who I was going to point out, but is probably already out of the tent, uh, needs a little bit of help moving the big white tent in the east lawn. So if you have uh, able hands and are willing to help for about 15 minutes, they need to move that tent. I don't know why. I just know that they need to do it. So that's going to happen right after the service. We're going to hear one more piece of beautiful music from Damien before we leave. And then if you can, head out to the East Lawn to help move the tent. And there's coffee hour downstairs for those of you that don't want to move a tent. May we go forth from this place willing to listen to the stories of others and willing to find their hopefulness and willing to spread that hope far and wide. Go with peace and courage. Before Damien starts to play, join me in our chalice extinguishing words on the little yellow card. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.